All right, Spin TV, welcome back. You've been patiently waiting. Today we have the second part of the fifth round of the 2014 Japan Open at Nasu Highland Golf Club outside Nasu Shiobara, Japan. I promised I'd bring somebody real special along today, and I have three-time world champion Nate Doss is here. Welcome, man. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. So Nate is somebody that has tremendous insight. He knows about playing under pressure, bringing home many different huge tournaments, including, like I said, the three world titles. So he's going to help us talk about what's in the mind and, and some of the challenges. And he was on the chase card right behind him, so he, he knows the pressure of this tournament as well. All right, so hole 10 is a par 3 98 meter that's about three and a quarter on the map and it's it's a downhill shot and these guys are looking to birdie this hole wouldn't you say Nate? For sure, for sure. It's a pretty basic hole um, but there is some danger. The OB on the right is a fake OB I guess. It's really the only fake OB on the whole course but um, they're basically aiming directly at that and just let the disc feed right down to it. The pro play here is the backhand hyzer for all of these guys, and you want to play wide, let it skip over with the lightweight disc and the manicured fairways, and don't get too far left and challenge that OB, but you have to put it far enough past that bunker so that you have a look for it too. You're going to see all these guys take that same route. Paul's going to be real close here with his, and uh, Ricky, who has... Uh, been in the lead, putting very solid and trying to maintain into the back nine as uh, the pressure really builds. He hangs one out wide right and gives these guys an opportunity for a stroke. I mean, interesting enough, um, Ricky's probably the only one throwing a putter on that hole. Um, I think these guys are mostly throwing drivers, playing the skip shot. Ricky is trying to throw a putter, and there was a left to right crosswind, and I think it just pushed it out. And Ricky is going to run this, and that's a good run. That's that's not easy to do a one-step little putt and get that much energy. Going to go just over the band and still have a little tester for a three. Simon lines up a long one. Doesn't take much time, as he's known to do. Just step up and throw the thing, and it goes right into the chains. Ricky's outside again. Hit that one for three, not lose too many strokes. And these should be pretty routine for Nico and Paul. And so when you're in these final rounds, you're coming to the back nine. You've got nine holes left of the entire tournament. What's your mindset at that point? Um, I think for all these guys, you know, they've all been in this situation before. Uh, it, it's mainly just stay with your routine, stay with your focus, not try to let some of the strategic things try to get to you too much and, and uh, just keep getting the birdies that, that you know you can get. And Ricky will lose a stroke to the other three on that hole. As we go to hole 11, this is another par three, 90 meter, just under 300 feet. We're going to film from the basket here. And the play again is a hyzer. They have to watch out for the green on the golf course, which is OB marked by the flags. Simon throws his wide and just doesn't get it back over. He was trying to play the power shot just past the bunker and kind of wedge it between the green and the bunker. Macbeth here is going to take a little straighter look at it. What was your play here? Um, I think the, the shot that you're just seeing Paul throw here is, is the shot. Um, the, the throw that Simon threw was really just a, a, a pull right, and he probably missed his line by about 50 feet. Um, as you can see there, Nico's skipping towards the left side OB. Um, Basically, just throwing a slow disc right at the bunker, let it come in right in front of it. Uh, you don't want anything too skippy. Uh, and, and those three guys threw um, some really nice shots. And uh, Simon, given the mark here by the rest of the card, he's got a death putt downhill, bunker in front of him, out of bounds behind him. He gets very lucky there that he doesn't pick up additional strokes. Certainly. Um, uh, yeah. That putt right there was maybe uh, a little nervous with that, but he did get a little lucky, and, and these are fairly routine for, for these guys at this point in the tournament. Um, you know, five rounds in, uh, you know, 15, 20-footers become, uh, you know, pretty, pretty standard. For these guys at this skill level, even though they've changed out their entire bags and are playing with these 150 class putters, being in the fifth round of the tournament, you do find out how they fly, and it doesn't take these guys very long to get that routine down and really start canning them from long distances. See, Simon takes out that frustration a little bit and laughs it off. We're going on to hole 12. Hole 12, this is a shot that uh, your card had a pretty good run at. Yeah, we we had three ace runs, and... and uh, I was the third one, and I ended up hitting the basket, actually. 
Um, this is one of my favorite holes. You can see what a, an amazing view of the whole valley below. Um, it's, it's a power hyzer. You just have to trust your line. There's a bunker in front, bunker behind, uh, but a, a fairly large landing area for, for the players to hit. And you can see Paul is going to be way wide of the basket, but he's still not really in danger of that left side bunker. He is going to have a long run putt at it from there. There is OB on the right side, though. You don't want to be in the valley, so you do have to make sure you don't flip that disc over and hyzer it back. As you can see, Nico gets a little too spiky on it and finds the bunker. In this part, you're 12 holes in. You've been battling against the elements, the disc changes, the competition, and uh, you can see the frustration starts to get to these guys. What do you do to manage those kind of emotions when they start to flare up like that? Well, um, you know, some players, um, some players have a game of being frustrated, um, so really that's nothing new for them, but uh, Simon's going to skip roll into the bunker there, but it's just about managing your, your again, like I said, your routine, um, and, and just kind of stay in the course, man. You really, you can't, you can't get too far off it. That's a great run by Nico. Um, one thing I will mention, the shot that you saw Ricky throw, uh, was a sidearm, which is surprising to me that he threw that. Not only is it surprising to me, but he got extremely lunky by skipping out of the bunker and uh, putting himself within like, you know, seems like 20 feet and, and he'll probably go ahead and tap that in. But um, that's just a, a testament to you do need to get a little bit of luck uh, as you come down the stretch. And you could tell, you know, both of us have backgrounds of basketball, and it's the old saying, the shooter's roll. Sometimes when you just, you're hot, and you trust that shot to go, and you just get those little skips, those extra little things that sometimes frustrate your opponents and cause them to get out of their game and play slightly different than they would have. Uh, you can see Nico's frustrated there. He really wanted to get this hole, and as there's a closing down in the fifth round, you played a lot of holes this tournament, and it's coming down to those last few, and you just really want to finish strong is the important part. Hole 13 now is a par 469 meter, about 554 feet by the caddy book. We're looking at the pin is going to be tucked uh, behind a little group of trees on the left side. The cart path will be OB. It's going to cross the fairway and uh, be to the left side of it. Ricky airs one out here, and you see Ricky airing him out high. Is that an adjustment that you have to make with these 150 class discs? Uh, I mean, I think it's personal preference. Um, yeah, I think the higher you get them, the longer they're going to glide, the lighter weight. They're going to glide that extra 40, 50 feet for sure. Um, you know, my play was to keep them low. I was throwing more power shots low. Um, but again, it's personal preference, and uh, you can see Simon kind of keeps that one low. Um, and just more of a power shot as opposed to, you know, something getting a lot of air. And that disc he's throwing all around is a Blizzard Champion Ape. So even in the Blizzard Plastics at the low weights, that's a really overstable disc that he just powers over into a flex shot that just shows you the power that the kid has. It's pretty incredible to watch. Uh, Nico plays it out wide right, which is going to give him a good angle at the green. For a par four, this is relatively short for all these guys and Nate, everybody you played with. You guys are you know, expecting to get a birdie on this. Yeah, this is this is the easiest par four of the of the two courses, in fact. And, uh, you know, these guys, this is pretty routine for them. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I didn't play this hole very well. I mean, I, I got off the tee just fine, but uh, for some reason, I just couldn't get it up near the basket. And the green is difficult if you leave yourself right. But for these guys right now, they're just going to tuck it in right there near the pin about, you know, five, ten feet and, and get their easy birdie. And Lester Simon right there, that was an eagle run he had from about 60 feet, but with the uphill undulation there, that can be tough and still stays right by the pin. These are tap-ins. Everybody's going to get a uh, birdie. We're going to star frame it and go on to hole 14. Hole 14, we talked a lot about this, is a sucker pin. And these par threes out here, they've tucked these uh, baskets between bunkers around cart paths and uh, things that make you seem like you want to go for it. But what's the danger? Well, I mean, we're going to see a sucker pin here in a few holes. It's even more of that. But, you know, this one is one of those you're looking down the fairway. If you land at the pin, you're going to most likely go OB. But you have to play this hole to the right. You can see Ricky plays it well right. But that's a that's a golf fairway. And that skip is going to be about 50 feet. And he was hoping for another probably 40 there. But um, 
the lower you get it, the more it's going to skip left. So you have to play it about 70 feet right uh, of the basket to land anywhere near the pin. You can see Paul's going to just zoom one right in there, and that's literally under the pin. Uh, that was a real nice park job. Curls the pin, plays it like you're saying, off this short fairway. Simon's going to make the mistake here of going high and more aggressive. Now you can see he lands left of the pin, takes a nice little hop, and that cart path is right there. And uh, most likely he uh, will be OB. And you can see you've been seeing all round in the previous rounds that these, these lightweight discs, they like to skip. And it's the combination of all three factors, the length of the grass, the wind, depending on the hole, and the lightweight of these discs. The discs will fly, and they don't always sit down so easily. So that's another thing that all these guys have to take into consideration is the touch factor on all these shots. Nico's going to run at it here and not really happy with himself. He definitely wanted to have that one. Uh, this is a big putt for Ricky, as he's not the closest one to the pin but you can't take a stroke from him when he's putting like that. It's reminiscent of what he did in Texas, and that's why he won that tournament, and that's why he's holding on to a strong lead throughout this uh, back nine. Yeah, I pretty much I want everybody to notice the way that Ricky's putting. He's, uh, he's, he's just very confident. He's standing over the putt, and he's just popping it in. You know, that putt that he just made was about 35, 40 feet, almost seemed like a 15-footer. So when you see any player putting that way, uh, watch out for sure. And you see Nate, uh, Nico is going to tap that one in. Uh, Paul, right yeah, under the pin. Right under the pin, easy to. Beautiful shot. And uh, we're going to go on to hole 15. Hole 15 is a tough hole. 702 feet, that's 214 meters. It is a par four. You're playing across the golf fairway, so the tee is going to be closer to the left side of the fairway, and then the basket is on the right side, on the rough, tucked behind a hill. And you're going to need to throw a big shot to get there, and then a vi you're going to need to throw power and finesse to get to the pin. What is the big challenge of this hole? This, this hole is really mainly length. This is uphill. Um, it's usually has been into a headwind, and the pin is located behind a large bunker on a mound. Well, kind of tucked in between two mounds, but with a, with a cart path on the right. So you can see Simon is making about the only mistake you don't want to make, and that's getting it too high going right. These players want to be on the left side of that golf fairway up there um, to access the pin as best as they can. And you could see on Simon's shot behind, the flag was blowing into a headwind like Nate was saying, and uh, the blizzard plastic sometimes can react a little stronger than the lightweight discs do to that win and just flips over and gets out of bounds on him. Nico uses that to correct off his and he's on the right side of the fairway. He probably would have liked to keep it a little bit higher, but he's going to be safe. Now you can see this is the way to access the pin. Ricky throws a sidearm, but he was so far back that he just could not get enough power on that sidearm and ends up in the bunker. And I was noticing that the, the sidearm players you know, they seem to be having a little bit more of an issue with these 150 class discs. Is it harder to sidearm them than backhand them? Well, I think you have to you have to recognize that it's going to probably skip more. That's the biggest thing that I noticed with it. Um, but yeah, it, it you know, with anything, you know, you get used to a a certain disc, and uh, you, when it, when it's lighter, it's just more harder to different. You know, you can see this shot. He put a little bit of Anheuser on it. He's thinking it's going to hook up. goes a lot straighter and ends up about 50 long. One thing I want to mention is that this is right about when it started raining. Um, they played the previous hole with no rain. We had a little bit of a backup there, and it just started raining. And uh, it's pretty much going to rain for the duration of the round. And this is tough, going to one of the toughest holes on the back nine, if not the whole complex. And uh, it's going to start raining on you just to test you even further and you can see Ricky's gonna miss that putt there is danger he could have rolled down the hill he does get a nice break there and cans the comebacker uh, to clean up his bogey yeah we're gonna see uh, Macbeth here is going to take a four Nico's gonna four and Simon is also gonna bogey here going on to hole 16 more sucker pins yeah, this is a huge sucker pin. This one, this this basket's just surrounded by bunkers, greens, danger. It's so deceiving. You can barely see the pin there on the left, but it almost looks like it's 
in front of this, there's a bunker out there. It's hard to see it, but these players are just trying to play it out to the right and swing it in. There's a gap that you can hit, but it is a sucker pin because if you play left or short, you're going to end up in that bunker and uh, you're not going to be happy about it. This is where big swings can happen. These sucker pin holes like we're talking about, being surrounded by bunkers, you're seeing a lot of two-stroke swings throughout the field, uh, which is pretty uncommon for disc golf. Uh, there's a lot more kind of one-stroke-at-a-time swings that happen at these big tournaments, especially with these guys at this level being so dialed with their upshots and their putting game. But out here is a completely different ball game. You'd see two- and three-stroke swings on holes that could just definitely frustrate you no matter how good you are and how experienced. So Nico actually pulled his drive and he ended up in a bunker on the right side of the fairway. You know, I'm surprised about that, but um, again, that's probably just due to the 150 class, uh, you know, uh, issue. Um, but, you know, maybe it had to do with the rain as well. And definitely both things that can affect your timing and release. And as we saw all tournament, uh, nobody played a perfect round. It was it was a grinder of a tournament and it was more about outlasting than really trying to achieve perfection. Uh, that's a solid putt right there by Wasaki, going downhill, making sure to not give up too many strokes. And uh, Simon has the park job. It barely sneaks it in under that chastity belt. You can see him smiling. He was happy to have that one go in. Paul will tap in his par. We're going on to hole 17. And this is a really beautiful uh, coming around this corner. You see the clubhouse in the distance. You play these last two holes. It's the home stretch. What are you thinking right here? Well, it's an interesting thing because, yeah, you are looking down the home stretch, but you have to get by this, this tee shot and this up shot. Hole 17 is, you know, if, if, if 15 was the second hardest, this is the hardest by far. Um, long uphill tee shot, um, cart path on the left, with, which Simon is going to go over there. But... Um, the nice thing is these guys are throwing with a tailwind right now, so they can really crank on it and let that tailwind give them that extra, you know, with, with the lighter weight disc, maybe 50 feet. And you can see Paul corrects off what Simon was trying to do is make sure that that disc breaks over and get the left end up so it carries to the right, gets you extra distance, but also keeps you safe away from the cart path, which is OB. That is a giant drive, okay? He just made this hole much easier. Um, I will say that the, the second group <laughs> ended up in the right trees, all four, four of us. And uh, Nico's throwing a roller here, which he's probably the only one in the entire tournament, but he's confident with it, and, and he threw a good shot there. Yeah, a roller with a 150 weight disc is no easy feat, and especially uh, you could hear it either hit the cart path or the curb right there. It took a kind of odd turn out to the right, but it doesn't matter when that upshot game is dialed. He's going to park the pin right there with the upshot. And, and, uh, and look at this upshot. I mean, there's a big giant rock there. The hole is on a mound. There's a bunker. Everything, you can't really tell the angle there, but that angle, that slope is, if you're putting towards it, you're probably going in that bunker if you don't, if you don't make it. That is a real testament to the level that all of these guys play with. Lead card, chase card, everybody, because this is... This is not an upshot that 900, 950 rated players can execute all of the time. And uh, just to show this is, is pretty incredible. And uh, this is a really tough putt for Paul right here. Right now, he's one stroke behind Ricky. There will be a final nine. They're both pretty safe in making that final card. But the tree is in his way. He's lining up an Anheuser look. Yeah, especially looking at the bunker. Oh, he hits the tree. Oh. Slides in. That's tough. That's just a real tough break, especially with Ricky's going to line up a birdie putt. And this is a clutch moment right here. He's going to put that right in. And we saw this at Masters Cup. We saw it the opposite way. But we saw Ricky roll down that hole 18 at De La Viega, and Paul had to hit a 40-foot death putt. So it's, it's kind of funny how these things sometimes do play out, that when that moment comes, you have to seize it. And uh, you know a lot about that, you know, winning three world titles. You know, can you think back to any of those moments that you just you knew you had to make a putt? Well, it's, it's hard to think back to very specific moments, but um, it's a standard situation. I mean, Ricky knew at that point, okay, the best Paul's going to get is a five. I need to make this. Boom, two strokes. Let's finish strong with a two and, uh, and, and never look back. It, certainly, it's one of those situations where when you get a little swing like that, uh, sometimes the, the gas pedal just is stomped. 
And when you have that winning mentality, like Nate, like Ricky, like Paul, all these guys do, you just put it in. And the hole 18 now, this is a tricky hole. You could see from the tee, this is a tough golf bunker. And it's a tough disc golf bunker because you're staring right at it. The pin is right on the lip above it. And there have been tournaments won and lost on this hole. Yes. You're going to see Ricky leaves it out wide right, allowing for these guys to get strokes on him on the last hole. He does have a three-stroke lead over Macbeth, uh, who is in second at this point. And that's a great st- shot by Simon. Yeah, that's, he landed within about a three-foot uh, section of the bunker there. And that's a very aggressive shot that he's known for taking. And this is a moment for Paul that he really needs to execute. And unfortunately, he's going to leave it out even wider than Ricky did. And uh, this is, you can see, he's not happy with that result. And this is one of those tester moments. We're going to see him, uh, you know, putting here. The, the bunker's on the left. He feels like he's got a pretty good line at it. Oh, wow. That's yeah. a tough roll. Yeah. That is that is two holes in a roll, in a row, that the roll off of the cage and the third time in this round that's happened to him and he just picks up those extra strokes, which shows why this course design really tested even the best in the game with these out-of-bounds strokes. Nobody got through this tournament clean. I don't even need to look up that stat to tell you. And Ricky comes through wow. once again. That's a 40-footer, folks, with looking directly at a bunker. If he if he misses that putt on the left side, he's OB, not going to gain that extra stroke. Um, and that was really just a huge swing right there. That was four strokes in two holes, I think. And, and uh, you know, now I, I can see Ricky's confidence just building for that final nine. And that is correct. He will go to a five-stroke lead over Macbeth and Nico birdied the last two holes so that's uh, going to give Ricky a four stroke lead over Nico who will jump Paul be up by one on him and these guys are going to safely make the final nine Simon had a tough round he had spurts where he looked really good but then he will actually fall out of this group and Dave Feldberg is going to come up from the chase card and replace him and you played with Dave all day and that's uh, that was a testament to his round yeah, definitely. Me and Dave battled it out, and uh, you know, it was uh, he ended up getting me by one stroke there. But uh, you know, it was it was a tough tournament. You know, it's five rounds uh, on really difficult courses. So the guys that are in the finals, I mean, they earned that right, and uh, it's uh, really a testament to their their ability to avoid disaster. Really, you know, that's kind of what we we're all trying to do. A grinder tournament this was. 99 holes were played when it was all said and done. Five rounds in tough conditions, dealing with new bags. You can tell Nate, man, I know you're exhausted. Your voice is is, uh, dying a little bit. Whether from the tournament or from karaoke, we'll never be able to tell for sure. We really appreciate you stopping by and uh, lending your insight today, man. No worries. Anytime, man. All right. So we still have one more video. Keep it locked. The final nine is coming up, and we're going to bring somebody in who was playing on that card. So he'll have that insider's insight from these last nine holes as everybody tries to chase Wasaki. It seems like a Texas repeat. Wouldn't he so far ahead? Stay tuned to find out. Keep it locked. Spin TV. Late.